So, yeah, this is a joint presentation with uh, Stephanie, who I've collaborated with for over 30 years, and um, she's a proper doctor. So we're both medical biochemists, but I'm the lab chap. So I think since, as long as I can remember, I was five or six, I loved natural history and music. But when I was about 11, I got hooked on molecules. My parents allowed me to build a laboratory at the top of the house. It made all sorts of dangerous gases and explosives. But so tonight, I want to take you from the natural history of Darwin's illness into the jungle of his molecules, which I hope to persuade you lies at the heart of really understanding what was wrong with him for over 40 years. But I should also say it's part of my own history. Uh, though I'm Welsh, half Welsh, I was born in Wales. But uh, you'll see from my accent that I don't have a Welsh accent because I grew up in Bromley. <laughs> and uh, of course, Bromley, if you look at a lot of the letterheads of Owen's letters, often Bromley is, is there. So I knew Down very well. I went to Down House often, and uh, one of the best badger sets I ever found was around Down House. So it's a fantastic honour for me to be giving the Darwin lecture since I was a teenager. Darwin was, Charles Darwin was a fantastic hero of mine. And even though when I was in the uh, chorus in the church choir, I got into terrible trouble with my <coughs> colleagues in the choir who couldn't understand how I could come to church and still believe in Charles Darwin. <laughs> but uh, that was a long time ago. So, in honour of our president, I thought I'd start to arouse your curiosity about this plant. It's a fantastic plant, it's a pitcher plant. So I want you to think, as I go on, as to what on earth has this pitcher plant got to do with this? And that is, I've had a bad spell, vomiting every day for 11 days and some days after every meal. So, this was in a letter that he wrote to his great friend Joseph Hooker at Kew in 1863. And so he was ill for over 40 years. And nobody was ever able to cure him properly or to find out what was wrong with him. And I hope I can persuade you that we do have a possible explanation for his symptoms. And also we have molecules which explain those symptoms. So when his illness started, well, some people say that he did show it a bit uh, when he was a teenager. But the first clear report was it's in his autobiography. And when he took up residence in Plymouth, waiting to go on the Beagle, he said, I took up my residence in Plymouth and remained there till the 27th of December. And I left the shore for England for the circumnavigation of the world. These two months at Plymouth were the most miserable which I have ever spent, though I exerted myself in various ways. I was out of spirits at the thought of leaving my family and friends for so long a time, and the weather seemed to be inexpressibly gloomy. I was also troubled with palpitations and pain about the heart. So these are really the first time that he had systemic symptoms. And the like of many a young ignorant man, especially with a smattering of medical knowledge, because his father was a doctor, and his famous grandfather, Erasmus, was recognized as the best doctor in England in the 18th century. I was convinced I had heart disease, I didn't consult a doctor as I was fully expecting that the verdict would stop me going on the voyage. And I was resolved to go at all hazards. So that's an interesting description of the first time. The next time was actually when he came back from the Beagle. So of course he married his cousin Emma Wedgwood. They moved to Gower Street. Those of you know Gower Street, the plaque is there where his cottage was. Interestingly, in John Van Wye's book, uh, Dispelling Darkness, which I expect some of you have read, excellent book, um, he might have bumped into Wallace for the first time because Wallace was living just around the corner. But the crucial problem was that he started to get ill. And of course, London wasn't a particularly healthy place in those days. So that was a major reason, not the only reason, but one of the reasons they decided to move out into the country, into Kent, uh, to Down. Of course, at that point it was Down without an E, and then they put an E on it to distinguish it from the place in Ireland. So some quotes. Uh, in his first letter from the Beagle, the misery I endured from seasickness. Now this is an issue whether this was related to his long-term illness or separate. Now I can tell you that I get seasick but I don't have any of Darwin's symptoms. 
uh, I found that I went on the research ships and I started to work in a major way on bioluminescence. And when he was on the Beagle, his diary, he describes seasickness, uh, he describes uh, a range of other things. When he got to Tenerife, um, of course, he'd been seasick right across the Bay of Biscay. And uh, those of you who've been on ships that they know what it's, what it's like um, to, to be in a storm on the, on, in the Bay of Biscay. He did have one or two other ailments. He had a severe inflammation of the knee and then an arm in Brazil. Uh, he had some fevers. Uh, he had fevers in Chile. Possibly it was typhoid. But as we'll see, none of these symptoms relate to his long-term illness. And I think this is a very important point when we come to deciding what he actually had wrong with him. So in his letter to Henslow, when he was back in this country, he states he had heart palpitations, eczema, er erythema, and headaches. And in his autobiography, he wrote, when he started to work on the barnacles, on, on the coast of Chile, of course, he found this amazing flowering barnacle. Although I was employed during eight years on this work, yet I recorded my diary that about two years, two years out of this time was lost to illness. On this account, I went in 1848 for some months to Malvern, to the hydropathic treatment, another very interesting point I'll discuss in a minute, which did me much good. So on my return, I was able to resume work. So much was I out of health when my dear father dies on the 13th of November, 1847. I was unable to attend the funeral and to act as one of his executors. So this illness went up and down, and it did often stop him doing major things, including his work, going to important family events. So what were his symptoms? Well, the first report, as I said, was when he waited for the Beagle in 1831. The second main one was when he was in London after marrying Emma. And then he did have a diary of health, which he wrote between January 1849 and January 1855. It is available now in book form and online. And it is very interesting how much he describes all the various problems he had. Of course, Emma looked after him amazingly well. So it was an amazing variety of symptoms. And the, these sort of days, when I was in Cardiff first, these were what medics would call multifactorial. I don't think they were multifactorial. I think there was one single cause, and I hope to persuade you about that. He had chronic fatigue. He had lots of gut problems. Pain, flatus, diarrhoea. Now, flatus, the Victorians weren't really keen on talking about party. So, belching, was it belching or was it flatus? Probably it was both. He had nausea and vomiting. He had a cyclic vomiting problem. He had severe headaches. He had swimming head. He had visual disturbance. He had skin rashes. He had mouth ulcers. He had joint pain. He had heart palpitations, insomnia, trembling. Hot and cold attacks, depression and hysterics, sobbing. Will you be depressed after all that long? <laughs> and his final illness was probably not directly related to this long term illness because it was related to angina attacks and probably heart failure or a heart attack, as you will know, on April the 19th, 1882. Importantly, there weren't problems that he talked about his ears. I'll come back to that in a minute because it's one of the issues about his diagnosis. He also grew a beard in 1860 after ill health. He got fed up with shaving, presumably. So over 40 diagnoses have been proposed over the 150 years since his illness appeared. There are three very interesting books that I could recommend. I have them all in my library. Um, the two famous ones are by the late Ralph Culp, who sadly died not long ago. And there's another one by a, a psychiatrist called John Bowlby, which you may be familiar with. It's a very nice biography, very scholarly, but I have to say, and I think the experts around now also agree, that he did not have a psychosomatic illness. He did have, perhaps, hypochondria, he did get depressed, but he had an organic illness. I don't think there's any question about that. But if you want to look at the details, the cult books are remarkable. And I must say, I'm very pleased to say that in the second edition, uh, he did give us a whole chapter about our idea about his diagnosis. So what were the proposed causes? Psychosomatic bereavement syndrome, because his mother died when he was only eight, hyperventilation and depression. 
so I reject those as the major cause of his illness because the problems were organic. The organic causes, arsenic, Chagas disease, many his disease. Now this was brought to my attention by Tony Gordon, I don't know he's here tonight, kindly emailed me when he saw that I was giving this lecture. Um, of course this ultimately is an ear problem, although there are some systemic symptoms associated with it, I don't think this can explain all his symptoms. Now John Hayden, some of you will have met, he was an Australian, he is an Australian, um, and he came to this country this year, uh, he's written in the Linnaean, and he's published two or three papers on his illness, and uh, he came to stay with us, he got on very well, um, we came to some agreements, but also of course we don't agree on everything. But his idea is because of the maternal link in the Darwin tribe, that there was a mitochondrial mutation, because mitochondria, of course, come into our cells by, from the mother. He had a variety of gut ailments, cyclic vomiting, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, and Crohn's disease is one of the di possible diagnoses. Now, we would argue that all his symptoms can be explained by lactose and food intolerance, because it doesn't stop there. Why was he intolerant to lactose and food? Chagas disease. This is the great bug of the pampas, very famous in South America, um, of the Benchuca. It's a common name for the kissing bug and comb nose bug. And it's called the kissing bug because at night it attacks animals and humans near the lips. Uh, and it bites, but it carries a trypanosome, which causes Chagas disease. And an officer on the Beagle, one of Darwin's friends, kept one as a pet. <laughs> Now, Darwin was bitten one. He reported in 1835, they were, near, they were in Argentina, night I experienced an attack, and it deserves no lesser name, of the Ventuca, the great black bug of the pampas, the disgusting, crawling over body, fat after blood sunking, and it gave it a meal for months. But the trypanosome is not carried in the bite unlike, of course, mosquitoes and malaria, it's carried in the faeces. But the problem is, is that when you get bitten by one, what happens is you do that, and it wipes the faeces into the, the wound, and then, of course, you can get infected. Now, Chagas disease is a big problem in Central and South America. It affects 18 to 20 million people, so it's quite a common problem. So let's look at some of the symptoms of these possible diagnoses. So I'm re rejecting bereavement syndrome. A, it doesn't correlate with clear, clear key dates, like his mother's death or his father's death, and it doesn't explain all the systemic symptoms. Arsenic poisoning, again, it doesn't explain all his symptoms. His father wasn't very keen on arsenic. He may have taken a bit of it. There is an issue, in fact, in the water in South America, which can be contaminated with arsenic. So he might have been exposed to it on the Beagle, but of course he didn't get his main symptoms when he was on the Beagle. Chagas disease, there are three stages. There's an acute stage, there's an intermediate stage, and there's a chronic stage. But none of them can explain all the symptoms that he had. And if he'd had chronic, he would have had it all the time. There's no evidence that he had any of the major symptoms in chronic Chagas disease. So I think we can reject that as a diagnosis. What about the gut explanations? Now, this is a very dear friend of ours, John Green, who is a consultant gastroenterologist in Cardiff. We've worked with him for over 10 years, and it's been a brilliant collaboration, actually. I've had MD students, and we've published a number of papers. You will notice as I go on, I have put a few publications at the bottom of the slides, not to, I hope, show off, but to actually show you that the work that we've done has been peer-reviewed and has been published in international journals. Not that necessarily means for all, but at least we have had it peer-reviewed. Crohn's disease. So this is a, a problem that we've worked on with John. Um, he had a lot of patients with, with the disease. It's a type of inflammatory bowel disease. And it can affect any part of the gastrointestinal tract. But the most common is in the ileum or the ileocolonic or the colonic. So for those of you like me who have to learn about medicine, you've got the stomach, you then got the small intestine, which is the jejunum, the, the sorry, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. 
you then got the colon and, and the la large intestine. So it, on the border, classically, that you get it on the border. The symptoms involve abdominal pain, diarrhea with blood, fever, and weight loss. There are systemic symptoms. One of the most common is, in fact, anemia. There's no evidence, as far as I know, that Darwin had severe anemia. And these other things like eye inflammation, headaches, of course he did have headaches. Now, the modern classification of Crohn's involves Montreal classification. And of course, modern medical people, gastroenterologists, they use radiology, they use MRI, they use colonoscopy, they take biopsies, and the histopathologist will look for inflammation and granulomas, which are non-cancerous. Darwin couldn't have had any of that, of course. There is a genetic component. So it is true that there are some aspects of Crohn's disease which might fit at least some of his symptoms. Irritable bowel syndrome. Now, this is one of the most common disorders that GPs see in this country. It's very, very common in places like Mexico. And I would like to argue, we would like to argue, that one of the reasons that um, it's not well managed is because people don't test patients for lactose sensitivity or lactose intolerance. The NICE regulations state that you don't have to test for lactose intolerance if somebody re reports with IBS. We would reject this completely. The first thing you should do if you go to a doctor with IBS is to find out whether you're sensitive to lactose. It's dead easy to do. I'll show you in a minute. There's a DNA test we have, but there is very simple, you just have to take the patient off lactose completely for a month and see what happens. So modern criteria use what's called the Rome criteria. The most common symptoms are abdominal pain, change in bowel habits, bloating and swelling, the urgent need to go to the toilet. But what isn't properly in the medical textbooks, which we have, I think, highlighted in our work with John and other, and with the food intolerance clinic that Stephanie set up, is that there are systemic symptoms. I believe the reason why this hasn't been looked at is because people just couldn't see how was it possible for the gut to cause symptoms around the rest of the body. We believe we have a molecular explanation for that. Importantly, of the many studies that we've done with proper ethical approval and published, we found the patients that were referred to Stephanie's clinic and to John's clinic that eight, something like 70 to 80 percent of those with IBS or IBD were sensitive to lactose. So there is then a link between lactose sensitivity and Crohn's. What sort of treatments did he have? Well, he, he liked snuff, but of course it wasn't a treatment, but whether that did him much good, I don't know. Twenty doctors saw him, including his father. His father uh, diagnosed things like log, um, treatments like logwood. Uh, potassium carbonate, and he was against arsenic, but he may have taken a bit, but he, there, are, there are letters which say, don't take arsenic, I don't like it, it's a poison. He saw uh, two famous doctors in London called Dr. Henry Holland and Dr. James Clark, who prescribed a whole range of, of things which didn't do any good, and you'll notice that there were poisons like arsenic, calomel, and bismuth, bismuth which I don't think would have done him much good, and certainly didn't cure his problem. And he's bread and milk. Now, that if you read Annie's box, you will see there's a quote in it about her grandfather's, uh, <coughs> sorry, a great-grandfather, Erasmus's recipe for the sick was bread and milk at night. My mother used to give that to me when I was ill. This is a disaster if you're lack of sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Moving to down was a treatment, but of course it didn't cure it. But crucially, one of the only things he got better in was when he went on Dr. Gully's water cure. And he had a lot of water, not very much milk. He certainly wasn't allowed to take snuff. So let's look at this famous water cure. And first of all, on the left, uh, my left hand side, I'll use the pointer here because it goes on both screens. One of the council members, Mark Seaman, who emailed me uh, day before yesterday, because he's very sorry, he can't be here because he's got an important um, committee up in, uh, up in Yorkshire, drew my attention to this lovely book, which was published in 2009, for the bicentenary. And it's about Darwin when he went to Ilkley. <clears throat> but as we shall see in a minute, it's a lot more important than that, because that is when the, On the Origin of Species was published. 
And there's a lot of fascinating correspondence between Darwin, Hooker and Lyle when he was in Ilkley. He went there for a water cure. But the one he went to first was set up in Malvern by Dr. Gully and Dr. Wilson. This is the book, if anybody's interested, I have my copy here, if you'd like to look at it afterwards. Uh, <coughs> and um, there's also quite an interesting book by Elizabeth Jenkins about D Dr. Gully. When he moved back to London, he got himself into awful hot water and was half accused of murdering, uh, laying his um, boyfriend. But that's another, another story. So. The diet, which is described in detail in this book, was involved soup, fish, meats, vegetables, but the drinks involved a lot of water, barley and rice water, wheat tea, sometimes a little milk. No buttermilk, which contains a lot of lactose, and all puddings are prohibited. Darwin had a very sweet tooth. If you read Emma's recipe book, there's a publication that I actually went up to Cambridge, to the university library where the original is, if you read Emma's recipes, over 75% of the desserts are full of sugar and full of milk and cream. So you would have had that in large amounts virtually every day. So these are the three places he went for the water cure. At uh, Malvern, to Moor Park in Surrey, and to Ilkley in Yorkshire. So this is the place he stayed at at Malvern was recommended to him by his great friend B.J. Sullivan, who was the number two on the Beagle. They remained close friends for the rest of Darwin's life. And you might be interested to know that the Sullivans actually live in Pembrokeshire. And they have some most fantastic Darwin memorabilia, which I hope one day we might be able to get out to the public. It's fantastically interesting. 19 unpublished Darwin letters for starters. Um, and also his cousin, William James Fox. It was set up by Dr. James Wilson and James Gulley, who looked for somewhere outside London. They found Malvern. And amazingly, when they went to Malvern, the whole tribe went there. Emma, the children, the servants, a huge conglomeration, all went to Malvern. Famous people went there, Tennyson and Florence Nightingale. So it was a very famous place in Victorian times. He took Annie there in 1851. And of course, tragically, less than a month later, she died. He was so upset he could never go back to Malvern. And so he had to look for somewhere else. But he said, at no time must I eat sugar, butter, spices, tea, bake. He allowed me a little milk, not much. So he looked for two other places. He looked at Moor Park, and he looked for a place up in Yorkshire. And Moor Park was obviously nearer down. Um, and this was set up by Dr. Edward Lane, the hydropathic establishment. He got better there, just as he did at Malvern the vomiting returned when he went back to town. Um, but he decided not to go there anymore, A, because he started to get ill again, but also because Dr. May got himself involved in the divorce case, and so he thought he'd better get out of it because it looked too, too dodgy. So he found this other place in Ilkley, and he stayed there from October the, uh, 4th of October to the 7th of December. Emma came up for a little while, um, he says, Dr. Smith, who set it up, I think is sensible, but is a homeopathist. <laughs> so Darwin was not keen on homeopathy, as I hope most of us are not. Uh, increasing dilutions, um, I'm afraid, don't convince me that this is a sensible therapy. But he liked Dr. Smith. Uh, and he invited a Mary Butler. Now, this is an interesting thing I discovered from this book. So just like his grandfather, Erasmus, it looks as though he was a bit of a ladies' man. Um, he also learned how to play billiards. And he got very enthusiastic with his son, William, about getting a billiard table for, um, for Down House. He got very competitive. But the crucial thing about all of these places is that when he had home cooking, he got ill. When he went to Wells' house, he got well. So Dr. Smith was very unkeen of Darwin going to stay with Emma in a house. He wanted him to stay at the, the proper hydropathic establishment to have the complete, uh, the complete thing. Because when he went to a house with Emma, of course, he didn't do the whole thing. But he did get ill when he went back. He got well when he went to the establishment. I'm very grateful to Mike Dixon and Gregory Raddick for allowing me to, to use some of the pictures from their lovely book. I think these 
possibly also in the Upkey Library. So this water cure involved drinking water, cold showers, cold baths, being wrapped up in linen soaked in water for hours on end. It sounds a pretty uncomfortable thing. Um, Darwin did actually build a cold shower at Elm to sort of see if he could continue it. Um, and he did get better when he had it. Very little milk, very little sugar. So some quotes in his letter in 1850, the sickness gradually decreasing and he felt restored after a water cure. As usual, hydropathy has made a man of me for a short time. Letter to Hooker, I had a terrible long fit of poverty yesterday, which makes the world rather extra gloomy today. That was just before he went to Ilkley because he'd started getting attacks again. Letter to his son from Ilkley, the water cure has done me much good. Another letter to Hooker, I'm hydropathizing and coming to life again after having finished my accursed book, which would have been it made easy for anyone else but half killed me. That, of course, is on the origin. So one of the fascinating things I've discovered as a result of this book from uh, about Ilkley uh, is that all the letters, well, I have a complete set of the ones published so far, this fantastic uh, piece of scholarship, uh, of course, from the University of Cambridge, uh, the Darwin Correspondence Project, and if you look at the letters, they are fascinating that he wrote and received when he was at Ilkley. Crucial ones with Lyle and Hooker. So for completeness, I've just made a, a list of the numbers. And you'll see that there are letters that he received from John Murray. And several that must have been lost because they're about the print run. They're about uh, details of the proofs because he was getting the final proofs. What's also interesting is how efficient the postal service was because they got there within 24, certainly less than two days from London to Yorkshire. Quite impressive. Of course, he had letters received from Huxley, Sedgwick. Crucially, Lyle and Hooker were very enthusiastic about the origin, on the origin, but Lyle was not persuaded that natural selection explained everything particularly the, uh, the origin of man. He wasn't convinced. And there's a lot of correspondence going to and fro. And eventually, Darwin did persuade Lyle that he, that he was right, which is quite interesting. Huxley and, and, of course, Hooker were hugely enthusiastic about the whole thing. Sedgwick, his mentor at Cambridge, who, of course, still had very strong religious beliefs, wrote a very, very sort of vitriolic letter um, to Darwin, saying, well, it's a magnificent piece of work, but I don't agree with any of it. It's all basically rubbish. But, I mean, that was a bit sad for him, but he expected it. He then sent letters to all sorts of people. He sent uh, copies to a whole load of people, like Charles Kingsley. There's an interesting one here to Leonard Jennings, who some of you will know, of course, was the person who was invited on the Beagle before Darwin because he was, was a son-in-law of Henslow. So it's very interesting correspondence. The correspondence with Island Hooker, I think, is very important in terms of how he want, how he persuaded his friends the, the, the whole essence of natural selection. He said to Lyle, I believe natural selection will account for probably any vertebrate animal. So what have these got in common? A hedgehog, a mouse, an orangutan, a tiger, humans, elephants, cattle, they've got this in common. And that is that all mammals, except white northern Europeans and a few other races like the Bedouins, lose the enzyme that digests this, the sugar in milk, lactose. Lactose is virtually unique to milk. I can't say it's completely unique, but in the amount that it's present, that's the amount that's present in this full in a litre of cow's milk. In human milk, it's about 70 grams per, per litre, interestingly, it's the most in, of any mammal, but it's unique. So what I like to say when I talk to kids about this is that, as we know, monkeys don't keep cattle. <laughs> so in evolution, once you've come off the mother's breast, there was no reason to keep the enzyme that degrades lactose. We, we've lost it, but there, there was a mutation sometime about 10,000 years ago which allowed the white northern Europeans as they became. And was it an important step in us moving up into the north plains of Europe after the last ice melting occurred? Because therein is only about 8,000 years old. It's very recent in human history. So the milk problem is this. You can estimate that something like 4,000 million people in the world cannot digest lactose properly. 
I use those words very carefully because the word intolerant, I think, is we can't get away from it, it's not we all use, but it's really what we like to call it lactose sensitivity. Everybody can cope with some lactose, it all depends where your threshold is. I can take the whole of that without any trouble, but it definitely takes a hundredth of that. She's ill for five days. So I'll just show you one case report. I have changed a few things for, the, for reasons of confidentiality. I hope you'll accept that. So this is one of Stephanie's patients. Eczema, asthma, arthritis, an itchy rash, diarrhea, nausea, sickness. Ten-year history of this. Whole range. This is costing the NHS a fortune. A whole range of treatments, none of which did any good. Now, one of the, the diagnose, diagnostic methods is to give a patient a whack of lactose and measure breath hydrogen. This patient did not show a big rise in breath hydrogen, but during the test, she had abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, headache, really half the symptoms that Darwin had. When she came off, milk with Stephanie took her off, all lactose, no sickness, completely cured. No medication was required. So it was a one of the dramatic cases that we've seen. So Stephanie set up the first food intolerance clinic in Wales. She's seen over a thousand patients. And uh, unfortunately, I was there at the time, the line manager came in, there must have been about three or four years ago, and said, Stephanie, the problem with your clinic is it's too successful, so we're closing it. <laughs> because her waiting list was not politically acceptable. Because the minister in the Welsh government was saying that waiting lists were less than six months, well hers were 18 months, because she was inundated from consultant uh, referrals and GP referrals. So the lactose intolerant, as I say, we prefer to call lactose sensitive, but I accept that everybody will use the word lactose intolerant, because people have different levels of sensitivity. So our revision of lactose sensitivity and tolerance is, of course, there are gut-related problems. Pain, gut distension, 25% of patients get constipation and not diarrhoea. I'd like to be another, another iconoclastic statement about physiology. The textbooks will tell you that lactose causes diarrhoea because of the osmotic effect. I reject that as a mechanism. Be very simply, because the patients that Stephanie saw, the ones that got diarrhoea, lasted for three, two, three, four days. Well, it's well after in the osmotic. It's a signaling mechanism analogous to cholera and enterotoxin. But 75% get constipation. 25%, sorry. But then the systemic symptoms are what's crucial in terms of relating it to Darwin's problem. And you'll see there headache, left, tiredness, muscle pain, arrhythmias, muscles pain. Now, every patient doesn't get every symptom, and they don't get the same symptoms all of the time. And depression. You'd be depressed if you had these and nobody sorted it out. Two which are slightly anecdotal because we don't have the numbers but need to be investigated. Three, recovered hearing loss after coming off lactose, and interestingly, five became unexpectedly pregnant. So Stephanie actually used to warn uh, ladies that um, they need to be careful about uh, contraception when they come off lactose, because it is anecdotal, but it is interesting. And I can tell you, we know for sure one of them is us, because we have a 15-year-old son because of it. <laughs> <laughs> so what's in your shopping basket? The difficulty now is actually making a lactose-free diet, because this, in 10 minutes, in test case, all of these contain large amounts of lactose, and yet very few of them have it on the label. Whey is very common, it's, and milk powder is added to breads, it's in biscuits, it's added to sausages, it's the browning agent in, in the crispy vegetables and crispy meats. It's all over the place, but often it's not on the label, not in this country. And the trouble with food labelling is, first of all, you need a microscope to read them. And secondly, of course, you need a PhD in biochemistry to understand them. <laughs> but this is a big issue we we'll try to um, discuss with the Food Standard Agency to see if we can get the labelling improving. But we do warn patients 
that they need to look at the labels very carefully. A is one of the things to avoid, because, of course, that's the liquid from the milk. There's a huge lactose industry in the world. You can see here that in 2010, it was about 400 million kilograms per year from the cheese industry. And this lactose is added all over the place to human foods and to animal foods. Now, animals, of course, because uh, like white, non-white Northern Europeans have lost their lactase after weaning. So it's not good news. Don't give your cat milk. That's why they get sick. So we wrote a, le le a recipe book, which you might be interested in, which, to, because we wanted to help patients really have a lactose-free diet, I am to like cooking, it's quite fun. So this is a summary of lactose intolerance versus Darwin's illness. And you'll see that if you look at all these symptoms, particularly the systemic symptoms, the percentage of the patients we've seen in our studies related it to Darwin's, they all match up. So all of the symptoms that Darwin had, we have seen in patients who have lactose intolerance. And it's the only condition I know which has proposed to explain all of his symptoms. He got better when there was little or no milk. He got worse when he was on milk with Emma's recipes and Anna's bread and milk. So some comments. Mike Dixon from Yorkshire. It's incomprehensible that he had long-standing Crohn's disease. He accepts our diagnosis. John Heyman from Australia is arguing for a mitochondrial abnormality. He said that the diagnosis of Crohn's does not explain Darwin's most troubled symptoms of episodic nausea and also the systemic symptoms. Uh, and he agrees with us again, that's quite nice. He also said, whatever you do, make sure when you give the lecture, the rubbish, the psychological, the psychogenic. <laughs> well, I'm not going to rubbish it because I think the Volvis book is a very good book. I think you'll see that we don't accept that as a, as a, a full diagnosis. And um, there has been a paper, some of you know, arguing it's Crohn's disease, but in an analysis of that uh, paper, um, the authors argue that he seemed to suffer a physical disease of the GI tract, but Crohn's, again, is not sufficient to explain all the symptoms. So how could lactose, that is the issue now as a biochemist, I thought, how is it possible for lactose here to cause headaches, muscle pain, and so on? So these are the sugars. The crucial thing is, this is a disaccharide. You can only absorb monosaccharides. I draw your attention to these two sugars, raffinose and stachyose, which are tri- and tetrasaccharides, which we can't digest. And they block the uptake of glucose and galactose in the small intestine. So here's a rough diagram of the small intestine. You have uptake mechanisms for sugar, Glucose and galactose by this method, fructose by this method, and then it gets into the blood with another protein. These tri and tetrasaccharides inhibit the uptake of glucose and galactose. They're common in root vegetables, so this is why the old silly schoolboy joke, beans, beans, good for the heart, the more you eat, the more you... <laughs> that is why, because it blocks uptake. So if you eat them with starch, like rice, it produces a lot of gas. I also draw your attention to this rough diagram of the villus. The cells which express lactase start here, and they move up, and then they slough off. Now, one of the, I think, problems in the literature is when people take a biopsy to measure lactase, they, the, if you spread out the small intestine, there's a single cell there. It could be the size of a tennis court, or some might say the size of a rugby pitch. So if you went to the Millennium Stadium next Saturday and took a blade of grass and took it to the lab and said, is the pitch fit for playing? I don't think they'd have much chance of diagnosing that. So it is a big problem that we only take very small biopsies when measuring the amount of lactase. And crucially, the amount of lactase depends on the number of expressing cells, not so much the amount of lactase in a cell. So when people have looked at the cause of low lactase, they're looking at the wrong mechanism. So I'm going to take you now into the jungle of biochemistry and molecular biology. Hold on to your seats for a minute. So it's a really interesting enzyme for a biochemist. Really interesting. Unique. Because you'll see that it has two numbers. We have enzyme commission numbers, D1 
to classify enzymes. It's one of the only, if not the only enzyme which has two. And this explains why you have to keep some after weaning. Because it has two active sites within the protein. One breaks down lactase, lactose, <coughs> A's is enzyme, O's is sugar. The other breaks down a compound called fluoridsin, which was found in apple bark. What's that going to do with it? Well, the site actually is for a cerebrocytes, which produce lipids, which help you to form nerves in the brain. So you have to keep a bit. It's processed in a bizarre way. It has a, quite a big gene. Uh, and as I say, it, it has to be processed in order to work in the villals, the cells in the, in the small intestine. So the mechanisms of low lactase is congenital, very rare. We've never seen a case of groups in Sweden. Inherited loss after weaning, that's a common one. Gut infections is a reversible. Um, rotavirus, bacteria, protozoa, Giardia, classic one. Hormone imbalance, not well studied. And also, whether or not it comes from the DNA bit or whether it comes from the processing bit, this also could lead to a low lactase and therefore make you lactose sensitive. These are the two potential ones for Darwin. So as a biochemist, I thought, how can this produce effects on the rest of the body? And it's about energy metabolism. In the large intestine, you have 100 times more bacterial cells than the rest of the body. There's very little oxygen. In order to make energy, it has to get rid of a very important compound in biochemistry called NADH. We don't have to go into the details if you don't know the biochemistry. But in order to get rid of it, you have to basically reduce it so that you make lactate or you make a whole range of other compounds. Some cells will make hydrogen gas to get, to get rid of it. That's the cause of the flatus. But when I looked at this, I could see that these were these compounds were diols, they were aldehyde reactive substances. And there's a crucial one which I realized could be important called methyl glyoxal, which actually is a very, very crude antibiotic because it stops bacterial growth, at least in tissue culture. So our hypothesis to explain the molecular basis of Darwin's illness and lactose intolerance is that the failure to absorb sugars in the small intestine overloads bacteria in the large intestine. There are two reasons for failure. One is lack of degradation because you've got a low lactase. The second is inhibition of absorption, which can occur as a result of these double whammy sugars which block uptake. There's anaerobic metabolism, no oxygen, which generates these toxins. The toxins are small organic molecules or peptides. They're absorbed and they affect cells around the body. And they can also, crucially we've discovered, modify plasma proteins and neurotransmitters. I'll just very, very quickly show you that we have got evidence to support this. So what have these all got in common? Running, thinking, growing, conceiving, dying, seeing, being ill, buzzing. Well, the answer is this. This is the uh, eye that I've spent 40 years studying because it's the universal switch in the whole of your body and the whole of life, animals, plants, and a lot of microbes. So you're born on a wave of calcium, because when the, the sperm of your father hit your mother's egg, generated a calcium wave, and the egg divided into two, you started. You're born on a wave of calcium, because the uterine muscle, which thrust you out into the world, was signaled to contract by a little puff of calcium in each of those cells. You live your life on calcium waves. In the heart, neurotransmitter secretion, secretion of enzymes, the eye, Everywhere you look, plants, animals, calcium is a central signal. And one of the reasons I got into bioluminescence is because, as far as I'm concerned, the key experiment was to measure it in a live cell. Now, the concentration of free calcium in your cells is 10,000 times less than outside the cell. There's a huge calcium pressure, which is why evolution has selected it as uh, the universal signal for acute events in virtually the whole of life. We've used some model systems. So this is a, a Daphne heart, a water flea I found in our pond in Pembrokeshire. When you add lactose to it, it causes arrhythmias and it does things to the heartbreak. So we're looking at the effects on calcium signaling. One of these toxins causes an inhibition of cell growth. It affects contraction in the ileum. 
It has a negative ionotropic effect on the heart, and it affects ion channels. These are all very detailed biochemical and electrophysiological mechanisms to explain. But they do at least show that we have molecules which are produced by bacteria under anaerobic conditions without oxygen, which can affect, have toxic effects on human cells. And because I've done a lot of work with genetic engineering, we've also been able to show that these substances cause calcium signals in bacteria. These are the first time this has ever been shown. So this is the calcium concentration inside live bacteria measured with a genetically engineered bioluminescent protein against time. And you can at least see, even if you don't grasp the sort of significance of the peaks, that it goes up when you add these substances. And this calcium affects cell growth and does have effects on gene expression. And it does affect cell growth. Crucially, these substances can cause covalent modification of key substances in the blood and in the gut. 5-hydroxytryptamine, which is involved in part of the contraction of the gut, is covalently modified. Insulin is covalently modified by it. Both of them are inactivated by this covalent modification. So I think this is something we need to look at here with type 2 diabetes. And this certainly has potential for explaining when the gut stops and when you have a food intolerance. And the final part of this molecular story takes me to flamingos. Now, this actually is a complete red herring, really. But I show it to just highlight an important thing which we haven't thought much about. And that is this. This is uh, an organism called Holophorax. It was found in the Dead Sea, and it's a relative of the cells in your gut that produce methane. It's the third domain of life. I think we have the first evidence for the role of an archaean in a human disease, because actually Stephanie picked it up when we were writing one of our papers up. But what we found was that patients who had the most severe gut symptoms in inflammatory bowel disease produced methane but no hydrogen. So these were discovered as the third domain of life in the 70s. They usually were thought of as extremophiles that live at high temperature, high salt, high pH, low pH. But they have now been found in the human body, in the gut, in the vagina, in the teeth. And they are the cells that produce methane. Bacteria do not produce methane. Archaea produce methane. They are not sensitive to antibiotics. There's only one substance that I know has been shown to affect them, and that's a statin. I wonder if that has anything to do with the side effects of statins. So this basically shows, that's obviously total speculation, that when we measure breath hydrogen on this graph and breath methane, we get patients who have high breath hydrogen, have breath hydrogen and breath methane, or have breath methane alone. So it's an important part of diagnosis, we would argue, to measure both gases. Of course, this wouldn't have been done for Darwin. So I have to really sort of <coughs> end by talking about the DNA. Is there any evidence about Darwin? And what could it, there be an inherited factor here? Well, there is a family history, of course. His paternal grandmother, people often don't talk about this, Erasmus's first wife, Mary, died age of 30. She did probably have a bit of alcohol problem, but that's because she had pain. His mother died young and clearly had some of his symptoms. His elder brother had his symptoms. Never were. And if you read one of the letters from Ilkley, he refers to Erasmus as, that's, it, that's his brother Erasmus. He never worked and was a, basically a chronic invalid. Ten of his children, of course, three died young. When Ravarat in a lovely a book, Period of Peace, says, the Darwin tribe were well known for ill health. His uncle, Tom Wedgwood, suffered headaches and abdominal pain. He died of opium overdose at 34. Um, one of his cousins died young with, sim with symptoms. And Emma actually also suffered from severe headaches. I don't think it's related, probably, but of course she was pregnant a lot, having, having 10 children. But crucially, of course, he suffered for 40 to 50 years, probably died of a heart attack. So there is a family history. Now, in 2001, a, a Finnish group discovered that there's a polymorphism in a gene just upstream from lactase, which seems to correlate with low lactase. 
As soon as I saw that paper in Nature, I got colleagues to help us set up a DNA test. And this is rather an old-fashioned type of PCR method, but you can see that this polymorphism, if you're CC, it produces one band, two bands if you're TT, and three bands if you're CT. If you're CC, 100% of the patients we've seen are lactose sensitive. But if you're the others, you can still have it. So I don't believe it's mechanistic, it's a linkage. Then, so we have, there's a homeobox gene involved in inducing lactose, lactase, but can't be involved in its loss because it involves the whole cut. There are polymorphisms in this helicase which correlate with lactase loss. And then I'm sure, I'm not going to say much about this because obviously it's a slightly controversial issue and some embarrassment about it, but some of you may have seen the programme on Channel 4 about dead famous DNA, so of course I had to watch it. This is of course anecdotal, but I have to measure, mention it. And there was a claim that he has a mutation uh, in a protein called NOD2, or its other name is CARD15. John Heyman argues because there's a maternal link, there must be a mitochondrial mutation. And this is the one he predicted, but he told me that this is not the case, at least that's what he'd been told. But again, we don't have a peer-reviewed paper, so we can't really authenticate this. And then there are genes that may have been involved in the loss of lactase. So I think I'm going to skip this one, it's too complicated, but at least hopefully when I write this up, this uh, protein called NOD2 is involved in the immune system, and if you're a heterozygote with mutants, you have a twofold risk of Crohn's. If you have a homozygote, you have a twentyfold risk. But of course, it's not diagnostic. That's the crucial thing. It's not a causative gene like the genes for cystic fibrosis or hemoglobinopathies. So I'm going to end, I'm running out of time, with, I think, something which matters a lot to me and is a very positive outcome from our interest in lactose sensitivity. And that is the problem that Darwin had in chapter 6 of On the Origin, difficulties on the theory, or difficulties of the theory, depending on which edition we're looking at. Not other people's difficulties, his difficulties, the eye, the electrical organs of fishes, and bioluminescence. He couldn't see how small change by small change could suddenly, out of the blue, lead to a new phenomenon. And interestingly, he never discusses milk. It is in the uh, Descent of Man, I think, twice. But he never did. This is unique to, to mammals. So where did it come from? Where do the enzymes that make lactose come from? Where do the enzymes, the enzyme that breaks it down, come from? Now, we have two in our body. One is in the bacteria, which is called beta-galactosidase. And the other is in the intestine. Our cells, which is lactase, fluids, and hydrolase. And although you won't want to read the letters which represent the amino acids, you can see they're completely different proteins. Evolution's produced an enzyme which can degrade the same substance to two molecules there, and it's completely different in structure. So we have one of the most interesting questions for me as a biochemist in evolution, rarely discussed by the high profile people, rarely discussed. Where does a new enzyme come from? Now, I've been genetically engineering proteins for 30 years. I've never succeeded in changing a protein to something completely different. I've modified it, done all sorts of clever things with it. I've changed the colour, changed the affinity, I've changed how well it reacts, what it binds with, but it's still that bioluminescent protein. And if you look at the literature, there are a couple of claims that are not convincing. Nobody's actually done it. And this it's why I've been using bioluminescence. I had to show this, which appears to be a complete red herring, but it was actually the first description of Darwin in his zoology notebook. So I've been lucky enough to study this fantastic phenomenon for 40 years, to measure things in live cells, as, as, and also we developed a clinical test, which is now used in several hundred million clinical tests a year, actually, which started with a curiosity about a jellyfish. And it brings us to Fred Hoyle, who basically argued that Darwin couldn't work. He said, random mutations will be like a tornado sweeping through a junkyard, how it would assemble a Boeing jumbo jet from materials they're in. And this is why, he was a mathematician, of course. This is a bioluminescent protein, which has 196 amino acids. The number of combinations is 20 to the power 196, which is 10 to the power 255. 
if it was lactase, it would be 20 to the power 1927. It's just a ridiculous number. The number of stars estimated in the universe is only 9 to 10, 10 to the 21. So random mutation of every amino acid in a protein just doesn't work. Bioluminescence has actually solved the problem because we've been able to show that to create a new bioluminescent protein, you only need a cage, what I call a solvent cage, containing three or four key amino acids. So here we have it. The model I've used is the major protein in blood, which is albumin. This has the property that it has two main pockets which carry molecules around the body and also it carries drugs. And what we're able to show with one of these pockets, which is called sodlocyte 1, uh, binds the luciferin, which makes a, a light in the luminous uh, jellyfish. And the albumin, here's shown at the bottom here, produces light incredibly. And the so the site which produces this light, as you can see here, only has three or four key amino acids. So the same would be argued for lactase, which is unique to mammals. As I've said, it's completely different from the bacterial protein. Uh, would have evolved originally, it would have come about by just creating a small pocket with three or four amino acids. So Darwin's illness has highlighted this very, very interesting problem in evolution, the origin of a new enzyme. Now, um, three or four years ago, um, Stephanie and I were asked to give a presentation in the Cardiff Medical School, where I worked, for the Grand Rounds. Every week we have a medical case, and we have a surgical case. So, of course, we did it on lactose intolerance, but... We got a friend of ours who's an actor, shown here, Phil Rowlands, to dress up as Charles Darwin. Now, our colleagues were extremely polite. So as he sort of hobbled in and Stephanie started asking questions, they weren't quite sure whether to laugh or not. However, so she asked him how many children he had. And he said, well, I've had ten children and eight of them survived into adulthood. And uh, she then said, well, has anybody given you any diagnosis? And he said, well, um, I was told that I had Shagger's disease. But um, in fact, Stephanie then asked him, he, she, she said to him, well, now that we've diagnosed you with lactose intolerance, how do you feel about that? He said, well, that's fine. But the trouble is, it's 175 years too late. And uh, in fact, this was the title of our grand round based on an article by James of Anu, I'm sure you all know about him, know him, who writes uh, in the Sunday Telegraph. He picked up our first paper, uh, argued that we had one of the best arguments for his illness, but he titled his article 175 Years Too Late. So to sum up, the evidence for Darwin's illness is that uh, he had an organic illness with gut and systemic symptoms, that symptoms around the body. He did not have a psychosomatic illness, though he did get depressed. The symptoms, as I've shown, match exactly the ones we've defined for lactose intolerant, both in terms of the type of the symptoms and the timing. They start two or three hours after a meal. Other proposed diagnoses do not explain all of his symptoms. As a family history, so there is a genetic component. He'd only got better when he stopped or reduced milk, for example, on the Beagle, and he went on the water cure to Malvern or Park and Ilkley. Got worse when he took sugar and milk, so at Emma's recipe book, 75%, of her dessert recipes contain milk and cream. She also used special sauces quite a lot in the savoury part of the meal. He had a very sweet tooth, so he would have had a lot of milk and sugar. And Annie's cure of bread and milk would be a disaster for anybody with lactose intolerance. 
There is a search for Darwin's DNA. Uh, the Chagas disease test has failed. Perhaps he does have a risk gene for inflammatory bowel disease. But uh, John Heyman, who's written some very interesting articles about his illness, he proposed that he had a mitochondrial mutation. Apparently he doesn't have this, but we don't have a published version of his DNA, so we don't have peer review. What would be very interesting is, does he have the CC polymorphism in chromosome 2? If he did, then 100% of people we've seen have lactose intolerance, lactose sensitivity. But even if he doesn't, we've seen plenty of patients who are CT or TT. And finally, and most important to me as a biochemist, we have a molecular mechanism which explains the symptoms, the production of metabolic toxins by bacteria and possibly the archaea in the large intestine. Now, we also have proposed that these metabolic toxins could have other effects and be involved in other important diseases. So lactose sensitivity, irritable bowel syndrome, one of the commonest conditions seen by GPs and uh, gastroenterologists, heart palpitations, unexplained, and some allergies. But what I think we need to investigate now is what other possible illnesses could be caused by these metabolic toxins. Well, inflammatory bowel disease we've shown patients do have lactose sensitivity, Type 2 diabetes, because they can inactivate insulin. Parkinson's disease, because Parkinson described gut symptoms in his patients before they had shaking. And then we have other problems like Alzheimer's cancer. There is a higher correlation of people with prostate and breast cancer who drink a lot of milk. And infertility, as I described earlier, we have a personal experience with that. So, nothing's new. I thought this bacterial toxic hypothesis was quite original, but then I found a book in Hay on Y where we go uh, every year to uh, explore the bookshops. And in this book, published uh, over 100 years ago, it said that large intestine must be regarded as one of the organs possessed by man and yet harmful to his health and his life. The large intestine is the reservoir of the waste of the digestive processes, and this waste stagnates long enough to purify. The products of putrefaction are harmful. He then wrote, bacterial putrefaction is the cause of all disease. I wonder if you know who said that. Well, it's this man. He was one of the founders of immunology. He discovered phagocytes. Uh, his name was Eli Metchnikoff. He worked at past with, uh, with uh, Louis Pasteur in Paris, but his real baby was bacterial toxins. So this presentation argues that we need to re rediscover this hypothesis and see how it might involve not just lactose intolerance, but other conditions. And the positive side of this is also that it enabled Darwin to hide himself away. One of the main reasons he left London was to Kent Town was because of his illness. And Sir William Asher very kindly gave me this book some years ago, which also contains other famous people like Florence Nightingale. So Darwin hid himself away in Kent. He just worked every morning in his office and his lab. He didn't have to go to committees. He didn't have to write health and safety risk assessments. He didn't have to write ethics approval forms. And he, he, he didn't have to do any of the paperwork that we associate with modern science and medical research. And of course, he could always have a cup of tea in his lab. Great, wonderful, a dream come true. But the important thing was, it was enabled him to be creative. One wonders how much he might not have created if he'd had a more conventional life. So there's always a personal side to things. Fifteen years ago, I took a big risk to work on lactose intolerance as um, my main medical issue. So several of our family are lactose sensitive. I mentioned Stephanie. Our daughter, Georgina, wouldn't have got to Oxford if uh, we hadn't discovered she was lactose sensitive. And uh, she runs a fantastic entrepreneurial program at MIT now. 
Um, and uh, Emma is a bit bigger than this now. She's at Cardiff University. Lewis doesn't have lactose sensitivity. He's about six foot now, so a bit bigger than this picture. And also, I have three lovely grandchildren. Uh, note the ethnicity of um, my charming and lovely uh, daughter-in-law. So discovering lactose sensitivity has had a big impact on our family and our life. So finally, I come back to my first slide. What does this picture plant, which is uh, found in Borneo? Um, and uh, this chap, Chin Lee, very kindly allowed me to use his beautiful photograph of this shrew licking the sugar secretion off the lip of this pitcher plant. What it then does do, it doesn't drop itself into the pitcher. What it does, it defecates, producing nitrogen nutrients for the pitcher plant. Now, I show this to highlight the fact that lactose sensitivity is not just caused by lack of the metabolism of lactose itself in the small intestine, because double whammy sugars, which are found in a lot of plants, can block the uptake of glucose and galactose, and as a result, they end up with the bacteria in the large intestine and produce the toxins. So what this shows really is that nature always knows best as Darwin and Wallace taught us. I hope that the talk I presented on Darwin Diagnose is not just a very interesting argument for what was the cause of his 40 to 50 year illness, but has very exciting and positive things to t tell us about diseases that we don't know the mechanism of and the evolution of a new enzyme. Thank you very much.